I'd like to welcome you all for coming. This is wonderful. Um, I'm Kathy Kern. I'm the executive director of the Suffolk County Historical Society. Uh, we're the oldest historical society in both Nassau and Suffolk County, uh, founded in 1886. This building is a national landmark building. We are in the process of trying to raise funds so we have handicap accessibility and restrooms and an elevator and all kinds of good things. Major renovations are, will be going on hopefully soon. Like all good things we do at the Suffolk County Historical Society, our collaborations are wonderful with East End Arts, especially with their brainchild, Jane Kirkwood. She's a pleasure to work with, and she comes and she'll go, let's do something on death. Let's do something on death. I did a fabulous exhibit on death. Let's, let's do, and I love, that. let's do something on diversity, you know, and so uh, for Black History Month. So Jane has these wonderful ideas. Let's do flowers, you know, whatever. So and we always pull from the historic S collection and show the past and then we interject it with the contemporary and the living artists, which is a pleasure to bring that kind of new audience to the Suffolk County Historical Society. So this exhibit that we have up right now, Hidden and Forbidden Objects of Objects and Art of Intolerance um, Involving Black Im Images of Blacks in America, is the beautiful exhibit. This is David Byertire. He is one of the curators and really a historian and a scholar who put this exhibit <coughs> together. It looks the way it does because of David. It's the first time I gave up control of hanging an exhibit, and I was his gopher. I was just handing him nails. So he, it is, everything you see out there really is D David's vision. And uh, so Jane, because of the, the nature of the exhibit, we didn't want to invite the contemporary artists to do their images of racism. So we, D David culled from mass massive collections to get what you see out there now. And then Jane put together this conclave, <coughs> conclave whatever you want to call us right now, for um, panel for our collaboration part of this. Because it met sort of in the middle between what the two of us were doing. Yes. At the East End Arts, we've got a diversity show, which is all inclusive and all happy. And this was the opposite, where we came from, and America having been born with birth defects. <laughs> and so um, this is this is the collaboration that came wow, in the middle where way. yes we've come a long way but we still have far to go and uh, this is not only about diversity it's mostly about truth so we're just going <coughs> to really talk turkey here and, uh, and 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 say how we feel about things that you know each other might not know <laughs> what we are feeling this exhibition has given us a, a tremendous dialogue with the community and it's been mostly positive um, it's, they're not objects that you would see in a museum setting, but they are part of our cultural heritage. Whether you like it or not, they are part of our cultural heritage. The way that this we the Western expansion here of the Courier and Ives, it's an idealized, romanticized image of basically annihilating the Indian, right. <laughs> the Native Americans. Yeah. You know, it's very romanticized. So the, it, it's... In keeping with the Courier and Ives, that's why the Black um, the Dark Town series is up with it also. So it links everything here in the museum. Um, and I like I guess the panel should introduce themselves. Yes, let's turn it over to the panel. We've got a terrific panel. Oh boy, this is great. So <laughs> thank you so much. And I'm going to get my seat. Randy, why don't you start? Eric, why don't you start? Sure. My name is Erica Corbin. I serve as the director of community life at Collegiate School, which is a K-12 boys school in Manhattan. Uh, and the work that I do um, in part for, for my work, but also for my personal passion, is around anti-racist work in school and education. And I'm Randy Clancy, and I'm the diversity coordinator at the Cathedral School of St. John the Divine. I work very closely with Erica and also ground my work um, in anti-racist education. So where shall we start introducing our students? My name is Amanda Furmature. I'm a career educator of over 20 years here on Long Island. I'm also a very small entrepreneur, and I'm a part of a special group in Reeves Park, which is the Sound Park Heights. Um, it's an environmental coalition of people who are uh, like-minded for the North Fork. Okay, now we swank. He was the poets. My name is Marguerite Smith, and I say hello to you. We rarely say that 
language at Shinnecock, and that's part of the annihilation of our people. But we are here. We intend to be here. Creator put us here, and we have a job to do in, in caring for this portion of the earth. Glad you're here to discuss this with us. Um, my name is um, David Byertar. I'm the director um, of programming for the National Suburban Oral History Project at Hofstra University. Um, in addition, my um, background is African American material culture. And, um, you know, I found this to be an opportunity that I would not let evade me. So <laughs> it's a pleasure being here with you today. My name is Tina <coughs> Andrews. I am a playwright, a screenwriter, a producer, and a director. And my forte is placing historical stories on television and in plays. My, um, I, I probably would say that my biggest claim to fame is that I wrote the CBS miniseries on Sally Hemings and Thomas Jefferson's relationship for which I was the first African American woman to win the Writers Guild of America Award. Uh, I will have a play coming to the Southampton Cultural Center on Queen Charlotte Sophia who was the wife of King George III, who most people do not realize that this queen was a woman of color. So I tend to want to do the stories that are on the road less traveled. My name is Danny Velasquez Paredes. I am the President Emeritus for the National Society of Hispanic MBAs. Um, I am also on the Suffolk County Hispanic Advisory Board, as well as a couple of other nonprofit organization boards that I sit on. Um, my background is as far as marketing multicultural and diversity, focusing on the Latino and LGBT communities. So um, Erica and I are here as the moderators for this panel uh, because, well, because of initially a meeting that Tina and Jane and I had in August where we were talking about the importance of um, really focusing on diversity in the arts on the East End and the lack of diversity in the arts in the East End in terms of how it is um, accessible and visible um, to folks on the East End. But then it grow, grew into something bigger. Um, you know, the title of this is Discrimination in Post-Racist America. Post-Racist is in quotation marks for a reason. Uh, we'll get to that in a few minutes. Um, but Eric and I are here together very much because of our work that we do together um, and separately in New York City um, in schools. Our work is grounded in um, focusing on helping our students and their families and our coworkers understand the essential role that identity plays in shaping our experiences as members of communities and as members of society. Um, specifically, our work is grounded in understanding that racism and genocide are the foundational forces that built and shaped this nation and the economy and power structure of this nation. So these are tough concepts to teach. You can imagine uh, uh, Erica's school is a K through 12, mine is a K through 8 school, and we're working with young children mm -hmm. on challenging you know, their thinking around their own identities and the identities of each other and their relationship to histor the, the history of their country and their relationship to um, contemporary America as well. So, yeah. And one of the things that brought us here today um, is a project that Randy and I are working on as well for teachers in independent schools in New York State looking at intersectionality and talking about how different pieces of our identity can come together and all of a sudden take a whole new turn. And so for us today, you know, what part of what we're talking about is looking at these other aspects of identity, looking at gender and culture and ethnicity, sexual identity, ability, geographical location, to name a few, um, how those things impact how we experience the world, how we see ourselves, and how other people then see us, um, and what that means in terms of our access to different parts of society and also to what we need in order to be whole, safe, successful people going forward in the world and being able to fully participate in our society. So just to get back to that post-racist idea for a second, um, you know, it's a concept that is floating around and I think a lot of people feel very good about claiming, you know, that we are now living in post-racist America because we have a black president and Oprah Winfrey is successful and we did it. Yep, that's it. You're done, right? Yeah. You all set? Yep. Okay, we can go yep. home. Check it um, out the calendar. It's really important that we look specifically at the, the fact that these individual experiences are not indicative of the general experience in terms of oppression 
um, in this country. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that we've been talking about, and I think a lot of discussion has been around lately, is around Michelle Alexander's book, The New Jim Crow, and looking at how mass incarceration of young black and Latino men very closely mirrors the conditions that were set in place post-Civil War in the Jim Crow South. And then if you look at really any institution of society, if you look at healthcare, education, transportation, um, immigration, criminal justice, any of these institutions uh, still are set up to, initially were set up to, and still do disproportionately benefit white people um, and, and um, work in an oppressive way um, for people of color and, in, and also for poor people in general, poor white people as well as for people of color. Mm -hmm. And with our panelists here today, part of what we'll be looking at is moving beyond race in some ways and looking at the relationship between power and privilege that impacts our experiences across the multiple identities that we have and the similar trends that we see therein. All right, so when we're thinking about, you know, when we, we have this term post-racist, so it looks like we're, we're really focusing on racism. It is foundational to our work and maybe a lot of people on this panel it's foundational to, um, but it's really important to acknowledge that there are no winners in the oppression Olympics. You know, people have mm -hmm. multiple identities um, and we carry areas where we experience power and privilege and we have areas of our identity where we are disempowered. Um, so again, while, you know, I say that there are these negative impacts on people of color in society, these negative impacts also Im impact people who are poor. Um, it, they impact people who in other ways experience oppression based on identity in society. Mm -hmm. Um, looking at the immigration experience, we know that something that is disproportionately unjust, dangerous, and dehumanizing for people of color, particularly those who come from nations that we as Americans tend to view as less developed third world countries. And then just thinking about if we cross into another identity, and if we're looking at sexual identity, you know, there are over 2,000 laws that um, benefit um, people who identify as heterosexual that people who identify as members of the LGBTQ community do not have access to. So, you know, these, these, this combination of power and privilege both on, both on an institutional level and on an individual level when it comes to bias and discrimination and just our relationships with each other come together to impact our experiences, um, all the people on this panel's experiences. For me as a white woman, um, and a white heterosexual woman, a lot of my experience is grounded in power and privilege and has most of my life been unexamined and unexplored. So for me, it takes a lot of work to kind of examine the identities that I really don't have to if I don't choose to because I can walk out the door as a white woman any day and not really have to consider that um, my racial identity is going to impact me in any, in any particular way. So that's really important for me, um, and I say that to anyone else who identifies as white, that our work is, is specific and different, um, and I guess all of our work is different based on our identities, but particularly around racial identity. Um, we have a tremendous <coughs> amount of self-reflection and study to do to kind of relearn and unlearn what we've been taught growing up. So it's one thing to hear about these government and state practices and, and how those things work in discriminatory action against people and another thing to hear people's individual stories about how that's impacted their lives. So we thankfully have a panel here today who are willing to share uh, a bit of their own personal stories with us. And I think it would be great if we started with you, David, <laughs> if you would talk a little bit about what made this presentation here today compelling, you know, talking about these objects of intolerance, the sort of thing that people might want to put in a box and shove away and not ever look at again. You know, I think that the conversation should be a broader conversation, um, especially in dealing with people of color and even gender um, discrimination. You know, typically, you know, when we think of America, we um, for, forego the politics informing our country. You know, the idea that you did very much have a very wealthy white male dominated culture that established uh, a republic that now have has a very capitalistic um, way of doing things. So within that context, you know, you have to think of about every population of color in America having to go through a phase of cultural consumption. 
and and that's a, a very easy way to kind of put everybody of color in the same mm -hmm. pot because when you think about it, being African American and, and talking about you know some of the caricatures you know that have evolved out of American popular culture, many of those things have become the first art forms in America. Mm -hmm. Still, right now, you ask a white person to be cool, and they pretend to be black. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, and when you think, you know, about how language, you know, begins to um, become a part of mainstream culture, and movements become a part of, of mainstream culture. Yeah, and I want to kind of stick to the the topic of you know sound, the way it feels, and the way that it looks. I think in, in many ways, you know, I can see why America at this particular time says that we're in a post-racial um, era, because this is the first time in American history in which the commodification of both blackness and the Latino culture has been so beneficial to corporations. You know, <laughs> even the idea of, you know, you can sell one record from one own, unknown, um, uneducated street thug, and, and all of a sudden it represents the voice of, you know, a mass population. You make a billion dollars off of him, um, or off the genre, and then he disappears without a billion dollars, really? but he's he still the billion he records, the money, right. you know, or you know, everybody's complaining about there being a mass migration of, you know, Latinos into America. But when you go into your supermarket now, you notice that all the packaging is both in English and Spanish. Somebody's benefiting. You know, or when I look at commercials, I remember at one point, you could tell when there was a person of color in a commercial. Now, everybody's tan. So you're wondering, you know, what, what is he or she representing? <laughs> you know, in, in fact, um, I have a daughter. Um, I, I adopted um, two girls. And one of my daughters is part African-American and Latino. And I laugh at her all the time. Her name's um, Naya because when I walk into you know, stores with her. In fact, I can give you a great story. I was stopped in the mall for kidnapping. <gasps> because, um, you know, I was walking with my daughter. Um, a white couple saw me, you know, kind of tap her on the bottom because she didn't want to leave the mall. She wanted to get the candy out of the big machine. Like, come on, let's go. We got to go. So she calls the police. So I get to the door and, you know, police officer says, you know, someone says that, um, you know, this child is, is being abducted. I said, well, who's trying to take her? <laughs> you, know <what> I mean? <laughs> you know, I don't want to know. Can you escort me to my car? <laughs> you know? um, but the point was, you know, it, he's, and she grabbed onto my leg and said, you know, daddy. And then he's like, oh, you know, the, it, there's been a mistake. But the, the point that I'm, I'm, try, I'm trying to make to you is that when we think about you know a post-racial America, this is probably one of the first time in history in which you are totally saturated with information about what it means to be the other, mm -hmm. either defining them negatively or appropriately. Mm -hmm. And when I say that, I, I mean exactly what I'm saying. There, there is still very much a class system. Um, the place in which you know we are mm -hmm. located, in particular ads or even you know, in particular situations are very strategic. From the news, you know, to the Emmy Awards. You know, it's just enough brown sugar to make it sweet. You know, um, in, in closing, I'd, I'd say that, you know, I think it is an outstanding opportunity for us to be very open about how we feel and the type of tension that we feel when dealing with people in which we prescribe, you know, the title of other. Mm -hmm. Even in, you know, in the African American community, uh, among poor African Americans, there's a huge level of resentment towards Hispanic Americans. Mm -hmm. Or people of, uh, what'd you say now? Well, that's just, I'm a Im first generation immigrant in my mouth, and I go to the local library, and I pick up four migrant workers that don't have transportation, 
from the Spanish class to take them home. What does the librarian say to me? Oh, I think you need to sign up for the class first. You cannot just join it. And I have a master's degree, <laughs> and I'm here to pick up migrant workers, but the assumption is there. But what you just said, blacks resenting um, Hispanics, that's just the immigrant thing. You always resent the group that's just above or just below you, and it's always been that way, whether it's Polish or whether it's Italian or whether it was Dutch or whatever. Well, actually, it's, always, I, I want it's competition, right? No, it's not about competition. Economic. It's not about economics. No, you don't think so? No, and, and that's the point that I was going to make. You have African Americans who, who, poor African Americans who present, who resent poor Hispanic immigrants. Yeah, you also have ground. poor whites that yeah. resent anyone who subscribes to um, an identity mm -hmm. that affords mm -hmm. them the privileges of American citizenship. Yeah. And then you have a population of affluent and middle class um, people who think that they are subsidizing, yeah. you know, the experience of the poor. Mm -hmm. The problem is the poor is always looked at as being brown. That's right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So when you say welfare mother, you don't think about, you know, the few million mm -hmm. welfare mothers in the Midwest. I think it depends where you have worked and who you have worked. Because I'm just, I'm just, I'm doing, this is a general yeah. assumption. What I'm saying is people don't think about white people being on welfare. That's right. That's you, when you think face, poverty, when you think poverty, welfare, yeah, there are. That's the point. Right. There's, yeah. right. or, or when you think about unemployment, you justify unemployment of people of color rather than talking about the issue of employment and strategies right. on right. how right. to bring everybody up as, as a right. community or a nation. You know, whenever there are issues of, um, of even, you know, national security, the last people that you worry about trying to overthrow you are poor blacks or poor Latinos. And, or when you think of a terrorist, you seldom think of an African American <coughs> or a Latino, and now it's been linked to Muslims, but, you know, the question is, Muslims are religions, you know, so, but you... Uh, often look at a person of color in, in that regard, but that's a new phenomenon. No, I was very shocked. We'll, we'll have some time yeah, we'll for, have yeah, time for some questions. So, so to, to, to bring this you know, to, to a close, I think that everyone needs to address, um, to, to adjust their, their, personal, um, their personal lens and to make an attempt to first be sympathetic, and then secondly, to be empathetic. Because, and, 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 and just to validate your, your um, comment, the difference between being a person of color and being white is you can shut up and you could be Jewish. Yeah. You could shut up and you could be Irish, Polish, or whatever. <clears throat> it doesn't matter unless I'm Michael Jordan, you know, I can't shut up and be invisible. Mm -hmm. At one point, if I was Tiger Woods and I wasn't cheating on my wife, I could shut up and be invisible. <laughs> I mean, I can come to anybody's house. They'd be like, oh, Woods is here. First of all, when I, when Josephine got me into this, and one night I finally got around to reading the email, um, you know what? My eyes could not even see the word post-racist. Mm. I thought it said post-racial. Post-racial is a term we hear. Yeah. Uh, and my eyes saw post-racial, and I said to my husband, I think why don't we talk about the post-racial America. And, um, and he says, but not post-racist, right? <laughs> and I said, because we don't expect to see a post-racist uh, society. That's not something. I mean, we didn't expect to see a black president, but we don't. And we certainly don't uh, think about seeing a Native American president, but um, post-racist, I don't think so. Um, post-racist, for me, conjures up concepts of how we classify people, and then we keep them down. We keep them oppressed. We, keep, we exclude. We keep them outside of whatever are the goodies. Of but this continent was gifted to us by Creator, and here we are still to protect those, these lands. 
So when we hear a lot of discussion about racial and about people of color, we often think, okay, people of color is something that we experience individually. Going into a store, I'm going to experience whatever it is you think I am, and I don't know what you think I am. Do you think I'm African American? Do you think I'm Latin American? Are you going to speak to me in a particular language? Do you think I'm going to buy from the Goya shelf? Well, sometimes I am because it's an easier way of, of doing the, you know, what we, we call it SAMP. You might have called it Pasoli, you know. But, uh, so you are expecting me to behave in a certain mm -hmm. way because of how I look. But our minds, our, our, collect, our individual and collective minds, go to culture. And you don't see culture. In fact, most of American life has uh, mitigated towards, militated towards oppressing culture. And very often what we've come to experience, and, and someone a few minutes ago just mentioned the, the matter of, of uh, the suicide, high suicide rates known, well known in Dakota country, for example. Well, the, there is a high rate of suicide among Native Americans, and sometimes it's suicide uh, experienced in the form of, yes, slitting one's wrist, but, but very frequently it's also in those other forms of behavior, such as drug abuse, such as, as uh, you know, irresponsible use of, of motor vehicles and other things that kill us, how we eat. Uh, you know, we know we've got diabetes, but we are eating in an unhealthy way. We're not taking care of ourselves far too often. And indeed, we are engaged in cultural, we are engaged in personal suicide, perhaps in part because of cultural genocide. Mm. When you seek to oppress who we are, when you say we can't keep our fires, when you say we can't speak our languages, when you say we can't have our four or 10 days of mourning ritual for our dead, you are making us sad, you, whoever is, and you is that societal, those societal norms that make, that suppress who we are, suppress our expression of who we are, suppress our opportunities to care for what we know, what we have been taught to believe is important in this earth. And so cultural genocide and personal suicide rates, I believe, are very much uh, entwined and, and mm -hmm. uh, corollaries. Um, so, if that's a, a further explanation, I'm sorry, and maybe a harsh explanation, but, mm -hmm. but it feels harsh very often. Yeah. Uh, it, it feels harsh. Um, indivisibility. Indivisibility is actually the name, some of you who are familiar with uh, some of the work at the uh, American the Museum of the American Indian, uh, the Smithsonian, has been touring a, a program called Indivisibility, uh, in which particularly the lives of persons of Native American and African American ancestry are, are featured. Um, and again, you have people who are duly oppressed. They are oppressed in how they're their interactions are with the public, the assumptions made about who you are because of how you look, and you are oppressed because you're not allowed to join in the culture, the richness of cultural expression that may be important in your life. Um, should, I, I've just come through 30 some years of working on the recognition for the Shinnecock Indian Nation. And let me just say that so much of the history of racism in this United States has been uncovered through that, that journey. Mm -hmm. It's not simply that we, were a t we occupy a territory in the Hamptons, a much so sought after place in the Hamptons. It's also that in the 30s, writings were done about us and having any, you know, the one drop rule, any, African American heritage in your community could have been used and was used at various places and points throughout US history to deprive native people of their native, their rightful native nation claims. Um, and 
much, much, much to be discussed and, and revealed, and I thought I brought the Indivisibility mm -hmm. book with me, but I didn't. Im really important history in Virginia, well-documented history in Virginia of this, but also. So the, the Native people, I think, have, Native people, first of all, were also very racist. We have adopted many of the behaviors of the, the racist oppressor, mm -hmm. and we have often taken those same labels that others have have placed uh, labels and, and uh, segregations and isolations and rejections and discriminations. And we too have often participated in that with regard to our own and to others. Because we do experience this, this matter of privilege. Sometimes it's cute to be in the, oh, look at the pretty little Indian girl. You know, sometimes that's cute. How well? Oh, look at their dances. How fun. Well, when their dances extend beyond powwow weekend to dances that we want to do all night or to fires that we all year and to fires that we want to keep as healing fires, mm -hmm. as gathering places, then it's not so cute. Then it is a threat to the American society. When we say the way you are using your land is contrary to our spiritual knowledge, and we're going to not, it's rightfully ours, and we're going to fight how you're using it. That is something that's not well received. Um, am I angry today? I think I am. <laughs> <laughs> it's cold. <laughs> it's cold outside. I'm a angry today. Um, as I said, post, you know, I really, I really did. I saw post-racial. Okay, so that's an interesting term to talk about. But post-racist, whoa, you got me going. <laughs> Post-racist is not here. We do find ourselves in a state very often of cultural genocide. Um, you know, it's so easy to um, to just say, well, the individuals are are suffering racism. Mm -hmm. No, cultures are suffering eradication. Wow. And I think on on that line of talking about culture. Manny, could you talk a little bit about the work that you do and, and what you said to us earlier about speaking culture versus speaking the language? Sure. Um, <coughs> everybody knows that right now, I guess, being Latino is a hot commodity. <laughs> um, everybody from any single corporation to even <coughs> politicians um, want to be able to have our say, our vote, our money. And the first thing that I tell people is it's definitely not about speaking the language. Because first of all, of all the Latino communities that are represented within the US, we all happen to speak different variations of Spanish. So we don't even have a one language that we can say this is ours. So it's about speaking our culture. It's about speaking um, our roots to be able to try to figure us out. And that's the mistake that a lot of people often make, which is just to you know translate a regular commercial into Spanish and mm. yay, we'll have all the Latinos on our side. <laughs> doesn't really work that way. Um, I mean, a couple of days ago, they had the State of the Union address, and they had Mark Rubio, the token Latino of the Republican Party. Um, exactly. Thank you. Um, that was a great advertisement, and they missed out on it. I'm a marketing person, so everything for me is on a marketing mind. Um, yeah, they completely missed out on the whole after effect of the water. Um, but going back to, to, to the Latino aspect, his whole reason um, as to why they chose him, obviously, is because 75% of Latinos voted for Obama. Therefore, um, they feel the lack of, 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 I guess, of sense of, of Latino community on their side. Um, but what I tell my peers and, and my friends and anybody who will listen, it's, it's not necessarily that um, the Democrats were speaking our culture or our language. It's, it's the message that was coming across. So you could say one thing in Spanish, but if your message does not convey what you're really trying to sell, it's definitely not going to. And that was a downfall for them. I don't want to get political 
Actually, I do. I do. <laughs> it's cold out. I'm in politics. <laughs> I'm in politics. Yeah, it's cold outside. Thank you. I'm in politics, um, or I'm, I'm gearing towards getting into that aspect of that's going to be the next phase of my life, go, going into political activism and an activist at heart. So anything that has to do from that perspective is what I speak. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it's it's. You know, when you're, we're, you're speaking the language, yes, to try to convey the message, but the message itself is telling us that we are not wanted in this country, then that's when you lost us at that point, mm. you know? And that's basically what happened in there. Um, so it's definitely not just speaking the language, but it's definitely speaking a cultural um, <coughs> language, which is it's beyond spoken words. Mm. Um, you know, we were talking about some of the... Uh, little things that Latinos do in general um, I was generalizing because we all had different little things and, and for example we talked about um, how we love to linger um, I don't know if you've noticed your local stores or bodegas or laundry rooms or whatever you'll see a group of us always hanging out um, as a matter of fact one of the workshops that I teach when I'm when I'm teaching uh, people how to, um, usually towards Latinos, I teach them how to be able to um, go through the whole process of getting a job. So how to create a resume, how to go through the interview process, all of that from what to wear to what to do. The first thing I tell them is, I don't care if you bring your abuela, your abuelo, your kids, your neighbors, a hundred people in your car. That's fine, but only you get out of the car to go to your interview <laughs> because you don't need this whole network with you supporting you. But that's the way that we are. Mm. For some odd reason, we are um, attached to to our people, to our friends, to our families, and, and I don't know if it's it's definitely a cultural thing. Um, but we never do anything alone, which is, I, I happen, I think I'm probably the only Latino here today, so I'm kind of feeling a little bit lonely. Like, uh, maybe not, maybe not. It takes a little. Yeah, exactly. But, uh, but yeah, so that, you know, so if you see a group of us, it's not that, that we're, you know, You're not trying to take, yeah, we're not, we're not a gang, we're not trying to take over the store, we're definitely not going to rob you or anything, that's just the way we are, we, we travel in groups. Is your family, is your family sitting in the car, out in the cold? No, they're, not. they're actually home. They can make it, yeah. Tina. Yes, John. So when we first met, and we, I, we had a great conversation, one of the things that came up was the idea of art versus folk art, primitive art, this idea of the art of others versus... is always the folk art. That's the folk art and the primitive art, right? <laughs> yes, yes. And so when we're talking about diversity in art, and we're talking about um, the diversity of art in institutions or how we teach about art in schools, in classrooms, and what's shown in galleries right now, what's being shown in the gallery out here, um, what is the importance of that? Why is it so important for us to expand our understanding and include this quote-unquote other in what we share and what we know. How do we know about ancient Egypt? How do we know about the Olmecs? How do we know about um, Africa? How do we know about ancient uh, Native American peoples? We know that because the art was left behind. Their art. It was not considered for them to be fine art or folk art, it was art. And we learn about each other through that. And I find it always interesting that if you're not doing the blue boy, that that art is then marginalized into being quote unquote folk art. Mm -hmm. if, you're not, um, if you're not running your clay through a kiln and it's fired and you use the clay that's not fired, that's considered kid's art and the other is considered fine art. Mm -hmm. Um, we need to reach out to each other and look at each other's art and embrace each other's art as art. I don't think that we should marginalize it into anything. Art is art. It is how you feel viscerally when you see it. When you go out and look at that exhibit, those, the sculptures that are there are just as moving. I don't care what they're made out of, personally. I just know what I feel, which is what art is supposed to do. It's supposed to um, um, invoke emotion. The problem that I, that I have is... 
that there always has to be, particularly this month, the shortest mm -hmm. and coldest month of the year, <laughs> we, we, have, we do have this thing called Black History Month. It's important because we do need for you to know who we are, and we need for we need some semblance of assimilation, but we we have this thing called Black History Month, and then suddenly the art that you will see accepted in two galleries and in <laughs> we're all unhappy. It's going to be black people with do rags on their heads um, and, and and crying, and that's great. But there are some artists who actually, if you look at the art, you wouldn't know what they were culturally. And that art is moving too. It should just be art. Uh, I have also noticed that you will come, to, you will go to some art institutions, doesn't matter whether it's February, December, or April, you will not see any of us present. I, um, I, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm here, I'm here in Riverhead. This is 40% black folks here, used to be 50. And here we are having a discussion that's so necessary for, the, for all of our cultures to have together. Mm -hmm. And had I not invited my two friends here, <laughs> this audience is primarily the larger culture. Nothing wrong with that. It's just, it's just that, did the word get out to what is a large community right here? So I'm, I'm saying if we can do, if we can have more of these kinds of events, if our art can be on permanent display mm. in all of the various institutions. So that means hotels, that means grocery stores. I, when I go out to East Hampton, there's a, a, a Starbucks, there's art <coughs> on the walls at the Starbucks. Our art is art and, and should be shared with everybody all the time. I, have a, I just have a huge problem with us all being marginalized into one 28-day mm -hmm. period. And then we have to have a big event like this to point out that our art is only 28 days of this particular month. If we can start to <coughs> find a way to work together so that we can see each other for who we are and what we have to offer all the time, it would be so much better. I will start to see if we can get the word out. This is such a great exhibit. And I, I would like to ask you, how many black folks have come in to see the exhibit? Um, not necessarily schools being brought in, because we, we, we need to have that as well. But is there a large group? We've never had, um, since I've been a, this institution is very old. Um, <coughs> I was hired as a curator in 2008. It was the first time ever we did anything for black history. In 2008? 2008 was the first <coughs> exhibition that was ever done of Suffolk County. So we have to then reach out then to the live Others, yes. <laughs> so that like you know, the, like it's Dave yeah. Kirkwood coming and bringing in the artists, and even David bringing in the artists, you know, for this exhibit and uh, from their collections. It's very important to show them that history isn't a, a just dead one, dead just one, yeah, right? It's it's right now. We are making history mm. right now at the Suffolk County Historical Society. I know. I gotta. I, I I have to tell you that I I'm going to place a lot of the blame for it some of the imagery that we see that has a tremendous impact on our communities and the culture at large on my industry. Mm -hmm. We in Hollywood do have a tendency to only showcase one kind of type of other and then that becomes the imagery that, that is in everybody's living rooms and that's how you identify us. Um, I had an experience two Fridays ago coming back from Southampton and I will tell you that it was, uh, it was a, a little unsettling. I was actually, I found myself driving while black. Mm -hmm. And I was pulled over. And uh, I was a little tired coming back from, a, from a, a rehearsal. And thank God the program for the show was sitting next to me. And I said to the policeman, I'm a little tussy. He said, well, you know, you're weaving in and out. Have you had anything to drink tonight? And I said, no, I haven't. And it, the, the main cause was the brake light was out. Uh, so he said, so um, what are you doing over here? And I said, well, I'm uh, directing from a piece that, I, <laughs> that, I've, that I've written. And so he said, a piece that you've written? And I said, yes, that's at the Cultural Center. And I had the presence of mind to reach over and pull out the program and say, see, Tina Andrews, that's... That's me. And so he said, well, you're pretty articulate. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> okay. And he let me go. And I thought about it. Had I not had the program there, if I were less articulate and still driving <coughs> while black, right. I would have gotten that $185 or $235 ticket. And it's always such a surprise because I do forget sometimes, <coughs> shoot, I have to keep my black card on me at all, at all points in time. Because I may be pulled over by somebody who just simply has <coughs> a quota and they're saying, you fit a profile. Mm -hmm. You forget, it's so easy to forget. So I, my, my whole point with all of this is that if we can simply find a way to come to, together on an ongoing basis, so that we don't have to be marginalized mm -hmm. as others, that we're just simply part of the tapestry of, of whatever town, of whatever state <clears throat> in this country, I think that it would be so much better for all of us in terms of, of our understanding. I would like to personally see um, the word get out so that more folks are here at an event like this because it would have been it would be great to have the interaction between all of the communities mm -hmm. here. And maybe we will do this again and then maybe we'll get to a place where we won't have to do it. This is up till June. Yes, I know, the exhibit is. <laughs> yes, and, and, and as you know, I, I, I've been here twice already. I, I, I said to you that I was very impressed with the, um, with the, with the exhibit. So. That was well articulated. <laughs> <laughs> so for, for me as a person who works in schools, I think a lot about teacher as oracle. If your teacher tells you something, that makes it true. And if your teacher doesn't share something with you, then that means it doesn't matter or it doesn't exist. So Amanda, we were speaking earlier and you spoke a little bit about sort of this feeling of a culture of flattening of identity mm -hmm. for students. And what's something, you know, what is it that you feel that students miss? And what do you think that they lose out on not hearing about in our schools? Well, I, we were speaking um, earlier and I actually even said it's like a, they're a pancake. They're flat, doughy, and really don't have much children today. Um, they're not exposed, their experiences are minimal, and it's very hard as an educator to extract from my own sometimes and give to them because it's a blank canvas. They're, the community, or I should say their families are not as connected, I, I believe, as when it looks like my generation, my ilk are here in the room, would have been, and uh, that absence of discussion or talk or passing down of lore or things like this. Um, I just want to divert just a little bit if I could because um, my experience as being a teacher has been <laughs> um, very varied. I have come from an Italian background, Sicilian, very strict, had to get a hundreds and, or nothing less and um, of course I bestow that onto my children now in my classroom and I expect the best from them as well but um, you know you run up against parents and you run up against the public that don't subscribe to that these days. It's my child is special and that's great enough and whatever grades they earn is great enough for them and, it, it, and you, you know what I speak of. But there's an aspect of my life I cannot share with them. Uh, being a gay woman and trying to keep that under wraps with elementary school children is very difficult. Mm -hmm. I love them and I'm going to cry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but it's very hard. Um, in my own life, I was shunned and cast out by my own family. Excuse me. So for 30 years, it's been very hard to uh, keep that behind closed doors, carry on, keep on. And um, it hurts because I'd like to be whole. I'd like mm -hmm. to be whole mm -hmm. in front of them. I'd like to be as Many are you in your in your careers whole in front of them, mm -hmm. and um, it's very hard. Um, not having family since I was 17, 18 years old, trying to establish myself, trying to come out, my own bearings. Yeah, it was uh, a difficult time, but here I am, strong, and um, have given my life to the profession and the children. Um, my family is. Uh, actually in a box that I send on a carnival ride out of my mind mm -hmm. and I say to myself I'm on terra firma and they have left and each day I can carry on and each day I can persevere and each day I can 
give what I can to my students. Um, I then was able to purchase a home here on the North Fork, and it's a little slice of heaven. And because of that, um, and I realize that, I think I smile more, and I am uh, embraced to such an extent there that my um, sexuality has no bearing. Thank you so much. <laughs> Pleasure. Sure. I didn't think this would happen. <laughs> um, but, Diversity uh, will do it. Excuse me? Diversity will do it to you. Well, you know, it, um, it's tears of joy because I look at Jane and um, she was the link. She was actually uh, a, someone who, how are you? How, I would love to have you in our community and join us. And beach people are wonderful people. <laughs> <laughs> and they are. they are. And there are three and four generations worth of that there. And the priority is the beach and the sun and the waves. And who the hell are you? It doesn't matter. Come on and sit down and have a beer. And that's the way we live there. And uh, I've been uh, involved in preservation uh, and acquiring land to keep sacred ground. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it's you been. Forgive it. <laughs> <laughs> next, next step. Next step. Next step. So it's it's been a wonderful, wonderful acceptance into. Uh, a lovely place. Uh, the gentleman who's the head of the organization, his name is Eric, he uh, walked onto the property and he said, hey, how are you? So nice to meet you. It's lovely that somebody like you is here. Hmm. And I was alone. No, he, he didn't know who I was. He just said, like you. And I was like, what do you mean? A young woman like you owning a home, this is great. And then I went, yeah, and she's gay. And uh, we, we worked together. He didn't like, say, I'm happy too. <laughs> <laughs> we worked together like brother and sister. We, um, we do. And uh, it's been a joy. It really has. And um, it'll be my retirement to possibly become more active in uh, politics or in uh, some form of uh, ownership of, of uh, a corporate, you know, some kind of business that I'm looking forward to. But uh, right now, I'll fulfill my career, my, my probably five, six, seven years left of it, <laughs> um, the way I can, not behind closed doors, in a door sense, like keeping it in a closet, but giving them as much as I can, and uh, carry on. Have you noticed, so I'm, I'm, I'm just making an observation, have you noticed that when we talk about this issue, it brings up so much hurt and mm. anger I'm, and then I'm, it just, it does, okay, maybe, mm -hmm. maybe it is cold outside. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's There's one of pain, those in being not only other. from society, but from my own family. I mean, yeah. you know, I, I carry mm -hmm. that, of course. Mm -hmm. um, and it was religion that, mm -hmm. divi you know, divided mm -hmm. us, so I carry that. But I don't want to believe that I carry something as a drudgery mm -hmm. around, you know. Um, but yeah, and it's, uh, you know, I didn't introduce myself as, hey, I'm the gay girl from uh, Long <laughs> Island. You know, I didn't introduce myself because you don't know that I'm not the typical type. Um, or, you know, you're watching television, Modern Family, there's a typical type character. Or uh, RuPaul, you know, whatever. The, you know, the, or the gay parade in Manhattan, that typical, <laughs> that you're waiting to come into the room and go, there's that flamboyant person or that dykey lesbian or whatever. Um, so hopefully I don't get you know, checked into that box too quickly, so I can slip in mm. and do my work. Yeah, yeah. I think that you know one of the, and, and I brought this up earlier um, with um, Amanda and, and Ms. Smith. Um, I think that even being African American, you know, she made a comment about my socks. She said, "I really like your socks," and and I responded back. I said, "You know, most of the time that I dress, I dress to be invisible." Mm. And, and, you know, to, I guess, to elaborate on that, you know, if I came in in a pair of jeans and a, a T-shirt mm -hmm. that said hip-hop and, you know, expensive sneakers, no matter the cost, immediately, you know, not only am I wearing my black card, I'm wearing I'm going to rob you card, you know, you know, 
my baby's mama is waiting for me to, right. you know, so right. all of these things. So to be African American and to actually wear a suit isn't good enough. And, and when I tell my friends that, you know, I guess people who are a part of a certain class aspire to a certain aesthetic. And coming from, um, I guess, a, a small, rural, but very wealthy town in North Carolina, um, and even working in country clubs, you learn the aesthetic because you want to know who's going to tip you. You know, it's the process. <laughs> you can tell a poor white person <laughs> very quickly or someone who's coming in to rent a timeshare versus someone who actually owns property. And, um, and I say this because African Americans have always been familiar with every single aspect of white American mm -hmm. life. Because part of it is either we're serving you or we know how we have to know mm -hmm. what your reaction is going to be to our presence. Mm -hmm. That's right. That's very true. So in I guess the uh, early part of my life, my father spent six thousand dollars on a suit, a tie, and a pair of shoes. That was his gift for me when I went to college. And I thought he was on drugs. <laughs> <laughs> but he couldn't have been because he was a cop. Mm -hmm. He says, I'm buying you this because you're going to need this as soon as you step off campus. Mm -hmm. and I said, it's crazy, you know? Great Hugo Boss suits and make sure that the buttons are always bone. Mm -hmm. He says, you know, if the shoe doesn't have a leather bottom, then you bought the wrong shoe. <laughs> you know, your socks should always say that you're at the right place in the right time. And if you can't afford to dress down, dress up. Mm -hmm. You know, tie a tie for me. So I tie a tie. Well, tie your bow tie for me. No, you know, you got to make sure that the front flaps are always for it. Even rich people don't know how to get the front flaps always for it. <laughs> you know, so. But this class dynamic, we're always forced, you know, to deal with. The idea that if you don't, or you not, you're not able to accurately replicate, you know, this aesthetic that affords you to be invisible around a certain class. You're not let in, mm -hmm. you know. And and still to this day, you know, I I feel that, you know, even working for non for profits, I have to ask for money. You cannot be poor and ask for money. <laughs> <laughs> and the last thing you can be is poor and black and ask for money. You can't. You, you have to not need the money or look like you don't need the money to ask for the money and, and, and to get it. The worst part about it is that you have to give away your money to someone who can give the money back to you before you're even looked at as being responsible with money. So, you know, invisibility is a very costly endeavor. And I think that, you know, when you think about being black or you think about being upwardly mobile, you know, I mentioned before, you know, it's very difficult when you can't shut your mouth and be invisible. Sometimes being invisible is one of the greatest assets. You know, I remember going to Italy and they were having Festival de Cherry in Gubbio. And they run these giant candles to the top of the mountain. And this particular day, I decided that I was going on a jog. This was um, 1995, and I didn't know that at that particular moment, this village was angry that Africans were coming into the village <laughs> and selling things and not playing, paying taxes. So I'm there with other students. So we're all jogging. So I'm feeling a little bullish today, so I take the lead. So. It was only four of us, but by the time I got to the top of the mountain, it was almost 14 or 15 other people. We got to the top, and people started pushing me. And my friends turned around and says, why are you pushing my friend? And one spoke pretty good English. He says, we thought you were chasing him, so we came to help you. <laughs> So 
So invisibility is something that, as an African American or a person of African des descent, that you can't take for granted. Mm -hmm. So I understand. You are also the pain of not being able to express who you mm -hmm. who you are, because you understand the cost that you would have to pay it's if tremendous. you were it's you were visible. Yep. I paid for it already with family. How much more can I pay for it? Oh. Or, or even to share a story with you. My family is both Lumbee Indian and Ghana. Oh. Okay. And we're from North Carolina. Absolutely. Yep. Okay. So, but at the same time, you know, being Lumbee and being in, in Fedville is like saying I'm nobody. Because mm -hmm. you're not even recognized by the federal government. Even though you're the... Second, Second largest, largest Indian group in the United States. <coughs> third largest. Largest. Yes, third. Largest. And a third, third largest. So you deal with you know these these dynamics. Oh, I can't be black. You know I can go to a powwow, but if a farmer wants to take over my family's property because I can't prove that I'm Native American, mm. I can't claim the pro um, pro um, property. And if I can't prove that I'm an African or descendant of an African American farmer, I can't even file with the federal government that my property was taken from me illegally. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So I'm just saying, you know, even the fact that being projected, you know, onto you are so many different labels, and you have to decide is a dilemma in it, in itself. And you can see how people just give up, and how history becomes less important. Mm -hmm how you have to live in the here and now. And I wish African Americans traveled together in packs. Man, I would feel powerful. <laughs> because I think that in American eyes, they do believe we travel in packs. Gangs. They call it gangs. Yeah. Gangs. 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 Or, or the idea well, that when you, ever you ask someone white, what's the percentage of African Americans you know, in America? They always say like 30, 40 percent. <laughs> they think there's black people everywhere. <laughs> and we're like 16 percent. Right. Right. And declining. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to pass the <laughs> Somebody say, oh, it's that anger thing. I'm telling you. I'm sorry, I got you going on anger. But somebody wanted me to, I had uh, earlier on as we were preparing, I made a comment about. Um, working as a fairly invisible lawyer, you know, in a government agency, and uh, one day was talking with someone about, uh, whoops, <laughs> not invisible. <laughs> I guess we were talking about activities upcoming for the weekend, and someone was going to the opera, and do you like opera, and my uh, response was, you know, honestly, I'm really not that familiar with the opera. Now, I went to Smith College. I graduated from... Um, I don't know, NYU Law School. You know, I mean, my, my, my creds are okay. Um, you know, um, in fact, I was 16 when I graduated from high school, and you know, so I got some decent cred, um, decent pieces of paper in back of me. Uh, but anyway, the fellow says so, and I said, quite frankly, I'm just not that familiar with opera. And I said, he says, well, what do you do? Um, what do you mean you're not? I said, well, you know, honestly, my weekends uh, often tend to be moccasins and, and dancing to, to drumming. And he said, but I thought you were so cultured. Oh, mm. see? He's like, excuse me? <laughs> I am. Line. My yeah. culture, you know? Uh, and yes, I've traveled. I've been to Europe. I didn't go to the Louvre, only because the Louvre wasn't open uh, at the particular time we were there. Um... I enjoy the arts of, of most people's. I enjoy the arts. And where I have traveled, I've always tried to experience the arts of wherever it is that I am. Mm -hmm. But the notion that ours are, that we don't have art, mm -hmm. yes. is, is so offensive. The notion that because I don't know your, do you want to be told that you are not cultured because you don't know my culture? Or do we want to say to one another, let's learn one another's culture. Let's appreciate one another's culture. Yes. Let us, now, we may not prefer one another's culture. Mm -hmm. That's personal preference. Mm -hmm. 
but let us recognize, acknowledge that we all have cultures and that we all want our cultures respected and that we want them to be able to be shown and displayed. Um, we were talking earlier again about Black History Month and, and I said, well, you know, actually we get six weeks in Indian <laughs> country. We get, um, you know, that time between Columbus Day and Thanksgiving, we get asked, we get trotted out. And, and, and I would, call, you know, with the turkey trot out, I would call it the, uh, let's take an Indian to lunch month, except that what happens is, is let's have an Indian speaker at lunch month because you, they want you to talk, they don't want to feed you, really. You don't get time to eat. But, but, but we do get all segmented and put in our, our different spots. Some do. Now, as you're saying, there are still many people who are, do not get celebrated in any time of the year. Uh, and so we've I got. I don't want a celebration. It's okay. I just want to be accepted. You just want to be accepted. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. You know, um, but you, I mean, I suppose there's a time. There's plenty of parades. <laughs> <laughs> we have a lot of work to do. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Post-racist America. Oh. No. Post-racial America. No. And here we live Melt, in yeah. Long Island, New York. I mean, the most progressive, open-eyed, mm -hmm. right? Could you imagine what it's like in backwoods of Nebraska? Uh, you know, Tennessee, you know, <laughs> I, I shudder to think. Well, 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 funny, yeah. you, you know, it's funny you mentioned that because we were talking earlier about Riverhead. Riverhead has about 25% Latino community, yet none of those Latinos happen to be part of the police uh, force, apparently, because there aren't any <coughs> Spanish-speaking <coughs> police officers. And um, the answer that the town came up with was giving them Rosetta Stone classes, um, <laughs> because, you know, that's supposed to teach them uh, the language. And I, when I was doing the research to try to be able to obviously sound intelligent here, um, I, I, I came across the Rosetta Stone episode, and then what happened was that a lot of people, a lot of citizens from our area, from here, from Riverhead, they were talking about how we were actually empowering the police force to be able to communicate with the illegal aliens. Um, because of course, you know, in their minds, every individual who doesn't speak the language, um, who is of Hispanic descent, has to be undocumented, um, which is definitely not the case. I mean, I remember my mother, brought us to the States when I was nine years of age. She was in her 40s probably at the time. Um, and she never had the opportunity to be able to learn the language. She went to school, bless her heart. She took English classes, but she just couldn't grasp the full concept of speaking the language. So she spoke a couple of words here and there. She was an American citizen, yet she wasn't able to speak the language. Um, so if she were to live now and and see what some of the things that are happening just because of the fact that you don't speak the language mm -hmm. she would probably be faced with that situation you know not being able to communicate with the people who are supposed to be helping you out that's a really big downfall for the community in general so there we go. We're just going to open it up to you. <laughs> yes. Perfect. I have uh, two things I'd like to share. Uh, the first is that um, I went to uh, public school, high school, and college. And for the last 10 years, I've been reading American history. And I was never taught American history. Mm -hmm. Just, That's right. It's just shocking how. Uh, little mm -hmm. I knew as an educated person. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's just something to share with you. The other thing to do, uh, I'm very interested in the idea that you expressed about uh, folk art. Mm -hmm. I've uh, spent my life making things as a writer and as a artist. I'm sorry, you say as a writer? As a writer, writer and oh. a, as an artist. You're going to take a hold of it. <laughs> no one ever asked me, ever in my whole life, where did I study writing? Mm -hmm. Exactly. Never. 
exactly, exactly. But they'll ask Never, you where you but studied they art. Will always ask, mm -hmm. where did you study art? And mm. it's troubled me. It's very true. And it's confused mm. me for many, for a long time. Mm. And um, <clears throat> while you were speaking, I think I, uh, I think I've grasped it. Is that art is very immediate. You know, it's there, it's in front of you. Consequently, it's very threatening. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Literature is different. It's not as, you know, it's just a different thing. It involves a different And you thing. actually can be taught that, you know, how to construct a sentence and, and put it together. But I honestly believe, uh, if you believe in higher power, I do believe that when you are an artist, it does come from somewhere else and you become the portal through mm -hmm. which that flows. And so it's going to flow differently um, through you than through me or, or Manny. So why should we be asked to where we studied how to put together that which <coughs> we have received mm. from that other that other place? Exactly. But you know the problem but <coughs> when you write I'm sure you have a very similar experience to when you're making art. It's it's, it's using it's <coughs> well now well for me well lately I, I was going to say I'm, I'm doing so much art lately because it's a, it's a way for me to not write you know mm -hmm. it's, <laughs> that's my a way for me to procrastinate which is why there's so much art but they use the same sides of the, <coughs> of, of the brain right. but, but one clearly I did take classes for natural talent again comes from that other place so you can only be taught so much I just think that we, those of us who have been uh, gifted by God with the, the ability to produce art, are purist. And so I don't think we should be asked, where did you go to learn that? I agree. Mm -hmm. that's, that's my comment. It's but people so will pure. use it Always to keep you out of a gallery, though. Yes. <laughs> They'll use it to keep you, keep you out of a gallery. And a, per a person with a bachelor's in something will get in with really crappy art. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I, I, I agree with you on that. It's, it's, it's tough. <laughs> So you and, think and they shouldn't ask writers either? Where did you learn to write? Well, they never ask writers where did you learn. When you read it, the thing it's the it's thing. A, it's, it's a finished yeah. piece it's just of art. Question. When you if read you it, it either novel, speaks no to says, you exactly. No one says where did you did, did you go to Northwestern to and uh, who did you study under? True. But true. Painting, mm -hmm. art if Amanda mm -hmm. were to write exactly the way she when she became emotional, if I were to have read that, I would have it would have produced in me the same tears. I would not need to know whether or not you went to Northwestern NYU mm -hmm. well, to I learn how to write. Did it change my scenario? <laughs> <laughs> Still you, the same your, pain. Your comment, if I may, about dressing up to get money is just uh, struck me as so real. Because my experience, whenever I've raised money for anything I want to do, it's always been to put on my best clothes. And, and I learned that from a partner of mine once, Jeff Vaughn, who was a very poor young boy growing up as an orphan. And um, if he was looking for a dollar, he would wear his, <laughs> his best suit all the time. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't have that same experience, but I learned from him definitely that, that you have to look good when you're looking for a dollar. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm, I'm actually going, I'm actually leaving because I have another engagement, but I'm going to take Tina up on her invitation and we're going to invite all of you out again for a great party and celebration <laughs> so that we can have a more casual conversation and get to know each other. Um, I agree with you that our politics has to reflect our knowledge of this particular situation. Mm -hmm. We can't uh, afford for our friends and family members and people that we care about to continue along the same path. So I'm going to leave on that note. Thank you, Tina. <laughs> wow. Did you sign it, Tina? Did you sign it, baby? So on that note, um, again, I'll be around. If anyone wants to get in touch with me or want you know, an explanation about the uh, um, exhibit, just get in touch with Kathy. No problem. And, um, and I'll try to be here periodically you know, while the show is up. Thank so you thank you for that. having thank me. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, everybody. You should make sure to come to Shinnecock Powwow. But before mm -hmm. September, mm -hmm. come to our, go visit our museum, which is uh, called Museum and Living Culture Center. Oh, Not just yes. about Deddy, yes. 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 but just about...
Well, I'll come on a warm day because I there want you to be happy. Oh. <laughs> 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 Y'all have a nice day. Well, I'm not, well, then there will another not happy if I may. Um, the comment about education, about history. I don't even know who teaches reading in a history class. The Constitution makes reference to Indian tribes. How is it then that Indian tribes are supposed to have been wiped off the earth? The Constitution does talk about Indian tribes, and there, and this government, the United States government, supposedly is structured with states and with tribal governments. Mm -hmm. So this takes us to a very different understanding of culture as lived out in a governmental structure. That's why we say native nations, because we are governments. And I really have to throw this in, although it's got nothing to do with art, but it does have to do with image, and it does have to do with perception, and does have to do with our understanding. There's a lot being discussed in the, the news these days about an adoption case that will, is pending in the Supreme Court, and it's being discussed in the context of a family, and I know there are some adoptive parents here, uh, of, of, of a child who was of native and non-native heritage. The law was not followed. There is a, a law called the Indian Child Welfare Act that was not followed in this particular case in South Carolina. And the tribe, the, the Cherokee Nation, was not notified of the impending adoption. And so the court, oddly enough, the South Carolina court, figured it out and did rule that this child had been improperly removed from, uh, placed for adoption. The Cherokee Nation and the Cherokee father are now engaged. The child is with his Cherokee father. The mother did not want the child. Uh, theirs was a, you know, a temporary liaison, whatever, liaison that produced child. Mother didn't want the child. Dad has has indicated he does, but more importantly for following the law, the nation had the right to know and has intervened. Um, but there is a great deal of, of discussion in the, the news, and it's, very, it's become a very vicious, a, a viciously litigated matter that we're dealing with, those of us who, who practice in this arena, a very viciously litigated matter in which it's being said that the the native, it's, it basically can really cut out the underpinnings of much of current Indian law by not respecting the nation's rights in this matter, by giving a great deal of sympathy to the adoptive parents. And for me, very little attention is being paid to the fact of children who have been removed improperly from their native homes, or at least from knowledge of their native heritage. These are children that are going to grow up. And they're going to grow up, and they're going to be 30 years old, and we're beginning to develop, the, to show the research, to compile the research that shows that at age 30, you're going to see, you're going to know, want to know who you are, mm -hmm. if not earlier. You're going to want to know who you are. Nothing wrong at all, and it's wonderful that there are adoptive parents. But the individual who has been adopted also has a need to know, a right to know who they are. And so our, our personal cultural heritage and our legal requirements do meet in the Indian Child Welfare Act. Mm. Uh, again, but, the, but most of history doesn't teach respect for the native tribes, much less the native culture. Can we take one more question from the audience? Um, I'm wondering, you know, it seems like we still talk about differences. I think we should start talking a lot more about what we have in common. Because when I hear a term like reversed racism, I cringe. There's no such thing. Mm. Racism is racism. Discrimination is discrimination. It doesn't matter what your gender is or what your age is or what what your race is or whatever. And more and more in this world, we're not just one thing anymore. We have mixed heritage. So why do we need to choose and why do we still get boxed so much? And then if you really feel like something, if I would write something like, 
if you wouldn't hear me right, you wouldn't see me, I said, I write on paper, I strongly believe we should only speak English in this country when we communicate. I will automatically be what? Republican, or at best, or Tea Party at worst. But why do I feel this way? Because, and I speak Spanish every day. Mm. I speak six languages, I've been, I lived on five continents. I, know, I might not know everybody's little cultural thing. There's not one day I cringe about something that I'm thinking or comes out of my mouth or my head, because we all have our preconceived pre perceptions. Mm. But I'm able to recognize it when it happens, not even always, but sometimes. And if you all can just get to that point that we can recognize, or be open for criticism from others. Mm -hmm. If I say only English spoken, I mean so that we can communicate. It could have been Dutch, could have been my language, could have been German, could have been any Native American language, could have been anybody. It happens to be English now, and I'm really not anti-Hispanic, don't think so, and I hate when people say that immediately when I say that, because I happen to work every day with legal and illegal ones. So, you know, it's just, what it is, it is what it is, and we need to walk with that. And how do we stop preaching to the choir? By when we have our next party, we all bring one friend. <laughs> and <laughs> if I would, and one food item. And, and, I, <laughs> and I honestly said, that doesn't have to be your own culture, thank you very much. I don't have to bring my Dutch apple pie or my wooden shoes. <laughs> no, because look at it. <laughs> when I moved here in 76, right, where are your wooden shoes? What do I get asked now? No. Now I can ask, oh, do you have any drugs on you? <laughs> right? Legal drugs in Holland. Or people say, oh, you kill your elders, you kill your old folks. Because there's euthanasia that's legal. Mm -hmm. Well, only on this very special circumstance. So we can all go around the room and we'll all have our own experiences. So we need to share this with other people. Because I could have asked any of these people I work with, and I do regularly. I'll ask them to come to fun things, to parties. I volunteer a lot, ma maritime festivals. I'm Dutch. Yes, maritime is my background. <laughs> I can help it. But I'll ask any any person on the North Fork that you know that will come and eat at my house and have my food, but they will not go out in public and they will not come to a free event. So it's not even that we keep. I'm white and I'm keeping these people out. No, I invite them, but they're not comfortable coming either. Mm. It needs to go both ways. It really needs to come both <laughs> ways. <laughs> yeah, but you white again, you don't count, right? Yeah. <laughs> the next time we'll have dancing and music. Nice. That'll, open it. That'll bring everybody together. Can I just say something? Yeah, but yeah. You need to get beyond that, right? Mm. No, but music, you know, it's, it's, it's a great communicator. <laughs> we have, um, speaking of, of the fact that we all have, are mixed and we all have something in us, you know, there's a very exciting, uh, please hold it up, Anna. Jane has a little handout. It's a little <laughs> handout. It's a tremendous it's a DNA, a DNA oh. test, and it's a, tr it's a oh. tremendous discount. It's one third or one there is the one that is actually the one that's recommended. Yes. From because I, I spoke to them. Yes. 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 Do you have enough for everyone? Yes, yes. absolutely. Awesome. Everybody <laughs> takes one. No, Everybody yes, takes of one. Of I think what's important is what you're doing with the young kids. Because a um, famous gentleman uh, in the play South Pacific, there's a song that I think is, kids are taught at a very young age. Mm -hmm. And that's where it you starts. You have to be taught to hear and fear, yes. Right. Mm -hmm. Because they, I was brought up in the South Bronx, and um, I, I, I guess I feel lucky that I was. Mm -hmm. Because yeah. if I was brought up in the suburbs, my attitude would probably be different. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, also, you mentioned uh, all the disparity and all the prejudice and so on, but I also think that religious uh, uh, acceptance of everybody's religion is very important. Mm -hmm. That's right. mm -hmm. uh, even though I'm very strong in my own religion, I, I have a, a high regard for everybody else's religion. So, that's a good point. so they, they go that's hand in point. hand with this. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's right. I think no, you're what right. you'll that's find right. is the people who are, who are against different races and so on, also probably against different religions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's true. That's right. That's very true. Jeff? Would you like to say? Yeah, I, I, um, first I just want to say thank you so much for doing this because it's a really wonderful experience um, to be here and, and hearing everyone. Um, and I am Tina's friend, and I'm only half black, so just so you know, I'm not contributing that much to the diversity. <laughs> <laughs> humanity is, is actually one that and I think it's really in all of the faiths that we've all been created mm -hmm. 
in the image of the creator, and obviously if we're all different, then, the, then it's not the physical image, it's right. not the cultural image, it's something right. about something in us that we can't see. Um, but that collectively, we, as a, like all of humanity is, is on the brink of its adulthood. And when we think about like when someone is on <coughs> adulthood, it's when they it's when they are ready to leave their their family and embrace another family without losing, you know, mm -hmm. like what mm -hmm. they've come with. Mm -hmm. And you know, I think like you know, as we come and we see everybody like you can say like, oh well, I you know, I'm a I'm a Jamaican American, that's what I am. But I but I'm also a straight up American, and mm -hmm. I'm also a you know a lover of you know European history. Oh well, well, gosh, you know I so I'm something else. Like we're I'm I'm learning to embrace all these different things. But I really like what really st struck me was what you said about like you know like bringing someone and talking about like preaching to the choir because I really struggle with this myself. It's like you know we're all like-minded, but what about all the people that are struggling? Well, that's who's in the room. We're like, oh, <coughs> that's how you come to this. Right. 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 I was just thinking. There's this quote came to my mind, and if you, and I'll be really quick. Um, but I, I'm a I'm really into neuroscience, and there's been like these really interesting, um, really interesting <laughs> research in the last few years talking about how like the power of thought <coughs> and how it it actually can now be measured that like things that we think mm -hmm. kind of spread. And so it reminds me of this, this quote from um, a, a man named Abdul Baha, who was a, a Persian um, figure in the Baha'i faith who came in the early 1900s to the States and spoke a lot about like race and um, gender and you know just being that we're all just one family. So what he says is, um, if you desire with all your heart friendship with every race on earth, your thoughts, spiritual and powerful, will spread. It will become the desire of others, growing stronger <coughs> and stronger until it reaches the minds of all men. Mm -hmm. And when I think about that, it's like when you feel alone and you feel like you're inviting people and they're not coming, then it's also, I think, the time to look back at your heart and say, am I, like, mm -hmm. I can I fill myself with this thought, with this love for for other people, not seeing them as others, and trust that also there's that invisible tie between us that will help to carry that as well, in addition to things like that. <coughs> Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, so you'll <coughs> you know, Parisa is uh, currently playing Sally Hemings in mm -hmm. my Sally. play in Southampton, and she will also be playing Queen Charlotte Sophia, King George Whoa. III's wife, in the play <laughs> In May, so if you want to see her in action, Absolutely. please come and and, and check her out. Wonderful. Yeah, just a comment when we talked about English um, being the language, you know, for all to speak, and that's been a bone of contention <laughs> for us as native people. If you were to go to, if we all lived in France. And we, we would want everyone to speak French, even whatever nationalities we came from, you know. You're an Indian country. Well, that's you know, So yeah, you for, that's for us to yeah. hear, you know, right. and this is something that's going on right. and, and that's dangerous because yeah, well, what has happened, I mean, our, for us, we've had contact for well over 400 years, mm -hmm. so we aren't fluid in our language anymore. Mm -hmm. But there are Native people who are, English is not their first language. I have grandchildren. My grandsons, their mother is from Cochiti and Hamas Pueblo. Right. Those boys are their first language is in their Pueblo language, is in, Wakola, in, in their Wakola language from the Hamas Pueblo. That's their first language. I'm not and saying, they, what, no, do you, I, I, what do you think I, I speak with my mother? You know? <laughs> you know, I'm sorry, we're going we're gonna to let Josephine yeah. um, wrap yeah, us so up because this is our, this is our yeah. last comment. So, so let's, let's, let's listen is that, to Josephine. That with that, if, if this country, and that was something that this country was talking about doing, was making English as the, the first language, making English as the yeah, official language, official. by doing that, that was going to <clears throat> prevent native language from being taught mm -hmm. in schools. But you are your own nation, but right? You but we are nations, unfortunately, we are nations within <coughs> a nation. Oh. And the school districts would have to abide by that. Oh. So school districts 
whether they're on or off reservation, if it was right outside of a reservation, but that whole population was of Native children, they would not be able to be taught their first mm. language, their indigenous language. Okay, that's that education is because I didn't that is know. In, so this is the danger mm. of saying that yes, right. English should be the first language, should be the only language taught, Thank or you, the Jess. only language spoken in that way. That's the danger of that, because that then tries to eradicate the First Nations people's language. And that's something that we've had to fight for. And you know, they, they were trying to put legislation and we really had to fight for that to say no, if you do that, you're taking away the indigenous people of this land that other people have come to. This United States of America is here, but you're on top of people okay. who were here first. Yes. So our language is the first language. You should be speaking the language of Shinnecock. You should be speaking our language. <coughs> language. Color language.